Joy for the night. But what comes in the morning? Joy. Isn't that so comforting to know that whatever it is that we're going through, it will pass. Something better is coming. Joy will come. Not may come, not could possibly come. Joy will come in the morning. So if you're going through a difficult time right now, hold on because it's not going to last forever. And God has promised us his joy, his peace, and his love. So let's continue to hold on and encourage each other as we walk this Christian walk. So weeping may enjoy for the night, but joy comes in the morning. magnify the Lord for he is worthy. worthy to be praised I will okay still there Salve 
salvation be exalted. And may the God and may the God of my salvation be exalted. And may the God and may the God of my salvation be exalted. Amen. We're gonna. I'm gonna ask you now to stand as we sing what will be our theme song, I believe, for this week, which is Revive Us Again. We'll sing the first and the last verse of Revive Us Again, just before Sammy brings us the word. I'm going to try during the sermon not to refer to getting old too many times. But I have to choose between whether I can see my notes or I can see you now. So I'll try and see them both. Yeah. Yeah, I need very focals. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon again. How are you guys doing? Thank you for the wonderful lunch. It was wonderful. And thank you for your lovely hospitality. You're very, very kind and very friendly. I could, I could come here regularly if it wasn't so far. No, I'm going to stop mentioning how far it is to walk and stuff. So no references to age and to distance. No references. Wouldn't it be wonderful when we get to heaven? We can just visit each other anytime. Just fly over. It'd be great. It'd be great. But here we are. Um, miles keeps us apart, but hopefully we'll be together in spirit. Um, so thank you for a lovely day. A lovely, lovely day. And as Pastor said, uh, we continue throughout this week. We continue tomorrow night, Sunday night, yay, coming out on a Sunday, yay. And we're starting early, we're starting earlier on the Sunday, so you can get home in time for work on Monday, right? Most of you are probably working at home, right? So you do the Zoom thing, yeah, where you wake up, you have your pajamas on, and then I have a shirt up in the, in the room um, that I put on, on top of my pajamas or shorts or whatever for the Zoom meeting. You don't do it, it's just me? Okay, all right then, well... There you go. So yeah, so you so you got work at home on Monday morning, so you can come out tomorrow night.
tomorrow evening, not night, not night. It's not late. It's not going to be late. Tomorrow evening. And we'll see you, God willing, Wednesday also. Um, you know, that I, it's, it's funny um, doing, like, leading a series when you've been, I've been to so many series in my life. You hear all the different things the preachers say. If you were going to miss any night, you should have missed tonight. Because tomorrow, you know, I, could, I can't bring myself to say that. It feels so cheesy. It feels so cheesy. Yeah, but anyway, anyway. But tomorrow night, um, tomorrow night, uh, as message is, uh, it's about one of the most fascinating characters, fascinating characters in the Bible. Fascinating characters in the Bible. King Saul. So not Saul who became Paul, but King Saul. One of the longest reigning kings in the history of Israel. And he was a complete waste man. Complete waste man. But this, I mean, he was six foot six tall. He was tall, he was tanned, he was dark, he was lovely, he was handsome, he was chosen by God to be king. He was, he was talented, he could prophesy, he was strong, he, he had it all. And he threw it all away. Fascinating things to learn from King Saul. And um, anybody watch The Crown? The Crown, The Crown. So Wednesday evening is about royalty. Wednesday evening is The Crown. Fascinating story on Wednesday, Queen Esther. Fascinating, fascinating story. When you look into the time that she lived in, you realize how amazing what she did was. Fascinating story on Wednesday. And on Sabbath, um, Sabbath is, uh, I don't know what, I th I'm not sure what even I think of this man actually. Um, I have to forgive him for what he did with Uri Uriah and Bathsheba. I have to forgive him, uh, David, I have to forgive him. But it's a fascinating story about King David, fascinating about how the journey that God took him on in his life. And what you will find is that if you walk with God, you will find that he will take you on a journey of his making. And sometimes, what, no, not sometimes, all the time, what I found is we in church can give people a false sense of what it means to be a Christian. So you are not walking with God, right? and your life is all over the place. And then we say, come to the Lord and he will bless you. Come to the Lord and he will prosper you. Come, and we come to the Lord and we say, right, I'm home. I've been messing around all these years. I'm coming to God and we come to God, yes. And then God gives us maybe, I don't know, a month, maybe a month honeymoon, six weeks maybe if you've been really, really good, maybe two months honeymoon. And then God puts you in his organ grinder torture chamber, cauldron, fiery furnace, and just takes us on a journey to make us like Jesus. And that's what we find in the life of David, that God took him through, he took him through the cauldron of life to make him the man who God wanted him to be. And that's something we see in, in common with all of these characters. God took them on the path that he needed them to take to make them who he wanted to be. And today we're going to look at a Oh man, a fascinating character. Fascinating character. Um, I remember when I was younger and I was, I was a good Seventh-day Adventist. Um, I knew the rules of the church, but I didn't know God. And I didn't read the Bible, but I knew the rules of the church. Um, and then I started to uh, read the Bible for myself. And it, it, it blew me away. It blew me away. The stories in the Bible are just amazing. And I mean that 100% they are absolutely amazing I encourage you to read read a chapter or even read a book read the book of first Kings you won't be able to put the Bible down you will not read the book of Esther read Ruth you will not be able to put the Bible down so this is coming from the book of Genesis before we start let's say a word of prayer Heavenly Father speak to us today we're in need of you Heavenly Father you have so much to teach us we have so much to learn and we come to you, Lord, to be taught by you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you will probably discover that I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by you. I'm wondering what you're thinking. I'm wondering what you're thinking. Sometimes when you preach a sermon, somebody will be sat there. The whole time. And you'll make a great point, And they'll be. And you think, okay. And afterwards, they'll come up and say, bless you, my brother. The sermon was... And you're like, oh, okay then. People are fascinating. What, you know, the, 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 the makeup of each and every one of us. It's so unique, unique, so fascinating. I like listening to people. 
I like eavesdropping on people's conversations. I just like listening to hearing them talk, hearing what they're talking about in their life. Um, I like observing people. Um, I, I listen to people a lot on the train, and often it's, I'm coming home from train after work, so it's like five, six, seven o'clock, and it's people coming home from work, and they're talking about work and the boss who's an idiot or the, 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 the supervisor who's just, who's just useless, or this person who asked them to do it, and it's just, they're, just, they're just useless. And it's fascinating that the people I never listen, the people I listen to, they're never the idiot. So somewhere in the world, I don't know where it is, maybe some N, N1 postcode is a place where all the idiots live. Because it's never any of us, it's never anybody you'll hear. It will always be about the idiots, but, hmm? Not North London, SW, SW1, that's right, not North London. But I, people are fascinating, and um, we've, had, we've been blessed with three children, and seeing them develop all the way from the womb, seeing the first scan at 12 weeks, and seeing them develop and grow, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Um, our oldest daughter, Ashley, she, um, she's 23, and when, when Sheila was pregnant with Ashley, if we sat down in the front room, and music played, as she would move. She would move. And there's not so much music, she'd kind of be a bit still. And then music would play, she would move, she would move. And there was one song that she moved more than any other. It was a Fred Hammond song called No Way. No way, no way, you won't lose. Do, 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 do. That song, right? Yeah. The Bad Ventists know that song. Um, it's got a funky rhythm, and she would move to that song. And you know, when she was born, when she was younger, Guess what was her favorite song? That same said song. Our son Nathaniel, when Sheila would eat, he would move. And now he's grown up, what does he like doing? Eating, eating. Ethan, he was here this morning, he's different. He's, 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 <laughs> he, he likes to eat, he'd eat chicken and chips for breakfast, chicken and chips for lunch, chicken and chips for dinner. He'd eat chicken and chips on Christmas day, New Year's day, chicken and chips from Morley's. You have Morley's in Walthamstow? Or you have more the posh, the posh business? Well, in South London, we have Morley's and Dixie Fried Chicken and, and them kind of things. So Ethan's into that. He's into architecture. He's into buildings. Nathaniel, he, one of the first things I remember him saying when you tried to help him, he said, well, I, I, I want to do it by myself. I want to do it by myself. And he must have been one. And now he's 19. He basically runs his own business and he wants to leave university and run his own business. He just wants to do it by himself. And sometimes I'll talk to him and say, son, I don't think this is a good idea. And you can tell that he doesn't welcome it at all. They're fascinating, fascinating from, 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 from childhood, seeing them develop, seeing their unique personality develop. And the family we're going to talk about today was also uniquely fascinating, fascinating. Uh, two children born to a mother and father, the Isaacs family. So there's daddy Isaac. There's mum, Rebecca, and they have two children, Jacob and Esau. And they're different from, in fact, they're different from the womb. They're different from the womb. They're completely, completely different. So the first son is Esau. He's the firstborn. They're twins, but Esau came up, comes out first. And Esau is, from the, from the beginning, Esau is what you might call a man's man. Okay? He's strong. He's rugged. He's tough. If, if he wants to eat food, he goes and he hunts it. Yeah? He doesn't order online from Sainsbury's and none of that wheat nut nonsense. He will go into the field and he will hunt his food. He will hunt his prey. He's a man's man. He's rugged, he's hairy, he's strong, and his dad loves him. Loves him, he admires him. He's a man after my own heart. And then there's the other child, Jacob. Um, mummy's boy. He's an absolute mummy's boy. He, he came, Esau comes out first, but then Jacob tries to grab Esau and almost bring him back in so he could get out first. So his name is, is Jacob, which means supplanter, or he grasps the heel. Uh, supplant, supplant is to move you out the way. So if I was to supplant you out of your seat, I would come like I'm sitting next to you, but then I would just move you. And then before you know it, I'm in the seat and you're on the floor. That's a supplanter. That's, that's Jacob. He, he wasn't strong like Esau. Um, he wasn't a hunter. He, he couldn't play the harp. There's no record of him having particularly any particular talents. Couldn't play the harp like David. He couldn't fight like Joshua. He didn't have the intellectual mind of, say, an apostle Paul or the leadership skills of Moses. 
um, as he grew up, he did develop a talent, though. He developed a unique talent. Um, he was a shyster. He was a con man. He was a thief. He was a trickster. Don't leave your bag near Jacob. Don't leave your bag near Jacob. Your bag will be gone. In fact, your bag might still be there, but your purse will be gone from inside it. That, that was Jacob. Um, one of the first times we see Jacob, we see him living up to his name. Or maybe we should say we see him living down to his name. The story is in Genesis chapter 25. And it's one of the first places we encounter Jacob and his brother Esau as grown men. Genesis 25, probably around verse 29. Esau is the firstborn. And in those um, Middle Eastern, Near Eastern cultures, the firstborn gets everything. Absolutely everything. Are you the firstborn? You no, you're not. You have older sisters. Anybody here the firstborn? Firstborn, firstborn. Right, you get the lot. You get the lot. Secondborn, Dennis? First son. The first son gets it all. So sorry, the ladies. The, and second born, Rowan, you second first? You're second. We get nothing. We get nothing. We get the crumbs that fall from the firstborn's table. That's the way it was. So Jacob knew growing up that when so Isaac was rich because he inherited everything from his father, Abraham. Abraham was really, really rich. Abraham was so rich that Abraham basically owned an army, right? Abraham owned an army. That's how rich he was. When Lot was taken prisoner by the three different kings, Abraham took his own army and went and rescued them. He handed everything over to Isaac. Isaac was going to hand everything over to Esau, and Jacob knew it. But Jacob was a trickster. So his mind growing up is, how can I get this birthright off my brother? So Jacob was smart and cunning, but Esau was, um, what do you say about Esau? What's the phrase they use? He's a sandwich short of a picnic? Yeah, something like that. So Esau's coming in from the field. He's been hunting all day. He's hungry. He's famished. He hasn't caught anything today. Jacob is cooking his stew. He's learned to cook stew probably from his mother. His food tastes good, just like the lunch today, just like the cake, Suzanne's cake. Excellent cake. Um, so Jacob says to Esau, I will give you some stew. Oh, sorry, Esau says to Jacob, I'm famished. Give me some stew, right? And what would a good brother say? Sure, no problem. Or maybe if you're, if you're you know, a bit of an entrepreneur, a bit of an alpha daily, you might say, okay, I'll give you, I'll give me it for five pound. Yeah? My son Ethan yesterday, he said, I made one pound 50 yesterday. I made one pound 50, why? Hottest day of the year. He put water in a bottle, right? He got water in a bottle. He got our little um, ice packs out of the freezer, put it in his bag with the water, for cold water, and he took it to school and he sold them. Not bad. Made one pound fifty. And probably what did he spend on Sheila? Chicken and chips, probably. <laughs> Chicken and chips. So yeah, one pound fifty, two pound maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll clean your room for a week. That's what brothers would say. Clean my room for a week and I'll give you the stew. Not Jacob. Not Jacob. Jacob goes all in. Sell me your birthright. Give me the whole inheritance. For, for a bowl of lentils. For a bowl of lentils. And what does Esau say? Remember, Esau is one sandwich short of a picnic. So Esau says, yes, I'll do it. They shake hands, and that's it. He gives him the soup, and he eats the soup. I hope the soup was good, Esau, because you've just given up a whole load of stuff for that soup. So that's the first time we hear Jacob and Esau. The next time we hear about Jacob and Esau, we're, we're a few chapters on, Genesis 27. And this is worse. Isaac is now getting old and he can't see very well. Okay? He can't see very well. And um, he's getting to the time where he's thinking that his time is up. So he wants to pronounce his blessing on his firstborn son. Isaac is a man of God, so when he blesses you, it means something. So he wants to pronounce a blessing on his son. May God bless you. May God drive your enemies away from you. May God prosper you. May God give you children as numerous as the sands of the seashore. Jacob wants to bless his son. And that blessing is going to matter. It's going to matter. So Rebecca, Jacob, Isaac's wife, the mother of Esau and Jacob, Rebecca hears that Isaac says to Esau, Esau, go and hunt some food for me cook it for me, you know the way I like my food, and after you give me my food, I will bless you. Rebecca says, now this blessing is going to mean something, and I don't want Esau to get it, because Jacob is my boy, and I want my boy to get the blessing, not him, the rough one. So Jacob cooks up a plan, so he, Rebecca cooks up a plan, what we're going to do, we're going to trick your father, 
You will pretend to be Esau. I know how to cook the stew just like Esau cooks it. I will cook it. You will bring him, put some hair on you, and then tell him that you are Esau. He will bless you. You'll get the blessing. I'll sort Esau out. Job done. Bada bing, bada bam. We're good. Jacob now, who's supposed to be a child of God. Jacob disagrees with the plan. So you're thinking, great, this guy has a conscience. He's disagreeing with the plan because it's dishonest. No, no. He disagrees with the plan because he says, Father will hear, he will realize it's me because Esau smells like the field and I smell like the home. Father will know the plan and he will curse me. That's why Jacob disagrees with it, because we'll get found out. But the mother says, don't worry, let it be on me, I will sort it out. Does it, does it actually make you wonder why Jacob, a man of God, decides to go along with his mother's plot? Let me think about it. You're tricking your father out of giving the blessing to his firstborn son. And Jacob decides to go along with the plan. Could it be that Jacob's love at that time was for his mother more than for his God? Oftentimes in life, life will give us a test Life will ask us a question. One way of looking at of life, looking at life, is that life will, will continually, simply ask you questions. We'll just ask you a question. It won't ask it in the form of a question, but indeed, it is a question. Questions like, you are asleep at night, you've had a long day, and there's a knock on your door, and your four-year-old says, mommy, I'm scared. What's the question? The question is, how much do you love your children? That's the question, really. I mean, yes, they're knocking on your door, but really what they're trying to find out is, how much do you love your child? Rebecca asking Jacob to trick Isaac was simply a question, do you love God most or do you love your mother most? And life will ask us that question all the time. What do you love the most? Which is interesting because Jesus, when he was asked for the, which is the greatest commandment, he said, the first and greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. You know, I can preach about revelation and the investigative judgment till the cows come home. But really what it boils down to is, is God first in our lives? Do we love him more than anything else? Because that dictates our choices. What we love dictates our choices. And Jacob's choice was dictated by who he loved. You know, I... I I, Sheila and I often discuss and debate diets. We debate diets, different diets. Do diets work? Do diets work? No. Sheila says they work. We debate diets. And one of the reasons why I say that diets don't work is because a diet doesn't deal with your emotional attachment to food. It says, eat this and you'll lose weight. Eat this and you'll put on weight. That's cool. That's, cool. That's all fine. That's good. I'm sure you're all true. But chocolate knows my name. It knows my name. And when it calls my name, it sounds sweet, man. You know, four o'clock on a Monday afternoon, it's been a tough day, work has been rough, and I walk through the HR, walk through the HR department, and over on the top of the shelf is some Jaffa cake saying, hey, Sam, what's going on? And I just like... You know, I just, I, it's, it, no diet deals with your emotional attachment to food. And if we're truly honest, if we're truly honest, any of us who've ever struggled with food, really it's the emotional attachment that's the killer. It's the emotional attachment. It's, and if sometimes, if you really want to know how, if you're addicted to something, you really want to know, try and give it up. I'll give up any time. I'll give, okay, give up now then. Give up now. It's the emotional attachment to food. I, you know the amount of times I've prayed, I said, Lord, forgive me, I've eaten terribly today. Lord, please forgive me, and Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And then I wake up tomorrow, and I'm doing good until four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm doing until four o'clock. And it's not diet, diet, what diet, what diet, man? I just, I need to feel good, and food makes you feel good. I know we don't want to admit it, but food makes us feel good. That's why we go to it. And, and, and sometimes the question it's asking us is, which comes first in your life? Who truly is your God? For some of us, it's food. For me, it's been food. 
For some of us, it's our tech, it's our gadgets, it's our gizmos. For some of us, it's having something new. We love something new. We need something new, something new, something new. Even if, if you know, and, and, <laughs> and we'll buy things that are cheap just to get something new. We'll, what does it say? A woman will spend, woman will buy, what is it? A woman will, yeah, I'm be careful now. A man will spend... Hmm? Yeah, it was, I'll try and get it before the end. It's a really cool, witty phrase, and I can't remember it. Never mind. Yeah, it was something like a woman will buy two things for half price that she doesn't need, and a man will spend double the money on something he doesn't need, or something like that. Basically, we all have our, we all have our vices. Some people like being connected. They like likes. They like likes. They like likes. I like likes. I want to be liked. I want to be liked. I'm posting pictures. Have you ever noticed some people live their lives on Facebook? Live their lives on social media? Just, con I'm at the bus stop. I'm at the bus stop, and the bus is not coming. Now I'm getting on the bus, and the bus driver is rude. You know, and here's me, now I'm sat on the bus, and there's a man next to me, he didn't wash this morning. You know, just looking for likes, living our life out in the social arena. Some people are addicted to being right. Some people like being right. Some people like being in control. We're addicted to being in control. Some, some of us want to be respected, I want respect. And really, all these things are asking us, who do you love the most? The Bible tells us the first commandment is to love God with all our heart, our mind, and our strength. It also tells us then to love our neighbor as ourselves, which tells us that the first, there is an order of this. First of all, we have to love God. Secondly, we must love ourselves. Then we must love others. You say, well, hold on a second. Why do we love ourselves more than others? The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. So if I don't love myself, I can't truly love my neighbor. How do I learn how to love my neighbor? By how God is teaching me to love myself. Love is perhaps one of the most misused and misunderstood words in our language. Love is misconstrued, love is misused, love is abused, love is misplaced. Much of what we call love is actually self-serving. I've heard pe people say uh, um, uh, a gentleman who used to be health secretary, um, and he, <laughs> it was in the pandemic, and he was health secretary in charge of all of the lockdown rules, and then he was caught on a CCTV camera in his own office. He must upset somebody in the security office. But he was caught on a CCTV camera in his own office grappling with his uh, secretary. And um, I saw an interview with him. He's a married man, married with children. And I saw an interview with him and he said, I just fell in love. That was my crime, fell in love. And I thought to myself, you're too lie. Because, you're too lie because long before he fell in love, he would have had attraction. And that attraction would have led to desire, and that desire would have led to, led to what he calls love. Now, if he is now going to leave his wife, sorry if this steps on any toes, but really, sometimes you need to call out what it is. If he is now going to leave his wife husbandless, he's going to leave his children fatherless, just to be with somebody else, is that really love? Is it really love? If, if, if I'm a married man, and I'm married to my wife, and I'm in church, and I'm going to entice some young lady to fall in love with me and lose her soul salvation, is that really love? What kind of love is that? It's self-serving, disguised as love. Um, it's, it's, no, it's not a love, it's a feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm wedded to a feeling. I'm wedded to a feeling. And the thing is with feelings, feelings can change. Feelings can change. What was unpalatable yesterday can be palatable today. There's, have you heard, do you know waltz music? Waltz music, one, two, three, right? Um, love lifted me, right? Waltz music, three, four times, two, three, one, two, three. When that music first came into church, it was heresy. Heresy. Heresy because it was the music of the bars. They were going to the bars, they would get drunk, and then you bring that in church? And you bring that to, we, we're used to solemn music where, you know? And then you want me to, it was heresy. But now, we play Love Lifted Me, we say, yes, give me those good old fashioned Septet Betis hymns, which used to be considered absolutely barroom music. So the Bible constantly tells us to trust not in ourselves, not in people, not in things, 
but to trust in God and his word. God's word is unchangeable. God's word is shakeable. Our feelings will change. Our loves, our likes will change. P people, <laughs> you know, I remember, um, remember growing up, there was this group from Lewisham Church. They were called Second Birth. And they were banned from a number of churches. Why? Because they played guitar. Had a guitar. Had a guitar. Forget drums. I mean, drums were nowhere near. No, oh boy, no, nowhere near. But things change and feelings change. But the word of our God stands forever. But Jacob didn't realize that. Jacob was in love with his mother more than he was in love with God. So when his mother came calling and asked him to do something, he was willing to do it, even though it went against what God God said, and he would have known it because he, he would have been taught by his father. And he would have been taught by his grandfather. If you look at the chronology, Jacob would have been alive for many years when Abraham was still alive. So he would have learned for Abraham, from Abraham. So the thing is with Jacob, if you look at the history, the lineage of the children of Israel, God actually had chosen Israel. God actually had chosen Jacob. Rebecca was told by the angel that the elder will serve the younger. So God had chosen Jacob. God had chosen him. God did want to bless him. God did want to bring a nation from him. He was to be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Nations would come from him. His son Joseph would become the savior of Egypt. In fact, even Jesus, the savior of the world, would come from the line of Jacob. But how was God to do that through a man who was an absolute trickster? Let's see. Jacob was a trickster and he tricked his father Isaac he tricked his father Isaac into blessing him. He tricked his father Isaac. He went in with his father Isaac and he said to his father Isaac, I brought you the meal. His father said, how have you brought it so soon, my son? Listen to Jacob's words. The Lord your God gave it to me. Right? He's lost his conscience if, he, if indeed he ever had it, had it. Jacob leaves his father. His father blesses him. He pronounces the blessing on him. I bless you. You will be blessed. Your enemies will flee from you. You will be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. He blesses him and he runs out. No sooner than he runs out, Esau comes back. Man's man Esau comes back and he comes into his father and he says to his father, I brought you my meal. Isaac is shaking. What, what is this? What, what's happened? He says, I, 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 blessed, I blessed you already. No, no, you haven't blessed me. I'm just coming here. He says, yes, I blessed you, and indeed, whoever I blessed is blessed. Esau is furious. Not only is Esau furious, Esau has a temper. Esau knows how to hunt. Esau knows how to throw a spear through a running deer at 40 feet. So if Esau's after you, you're in trouble. Esau says, you know what? It's that trickster, thief, ginnel brother of mine. My father is old, and he's soon going to die, and when he dies... I'm going to kill Jacob. And everybody knew that when Esau didn't chat for foolishness, he didn't chat for nonsense. If he said it, he meant it. He was going to kill Jacob. And Rebekah, his mother, knew it. And Esau didn't business what his mother said. He didn't business what his mother thought. Esau was such a rebel that he went and married a Canaanite woman just to get his parents vexed. In your face, mom. You did that to me, I'm going to... Put this in your face. As my dad would say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. You ever heard that phrase, Eugene, in your family? Put this a Bajan phrase. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yes, indeed. So now Jacob knows that he's, he's going to be killed. Definitely his brother's going to do it. So in fear for his life, he runs off. His mother cooks up a plan. Go and live with my brother, your uncle, Laban. Now remember that God wants to bless Jacob. He wants to use him. He wants to make him the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph, the savior of Egypt, is going to come from the line of Jacob. And Jesus, the savior of the world, is going to come from him. But he can't do it through a con man. He has to teach him somehow to give up his dishonest ways. And what better way to do it than to expose him to somebody even more of a trickster than him. And he had been preparing this lesson for him for years. Uncle Laban. Uncle Laban. You remember Laban? You first come across Laban when Abraham sends his servant to find a, a wife for his, for his son Isaac. He finds, um, he prays and asks God, please show me a woman who will be Isaac's wife. I'm going to wait here and if somebody comes and, and, and comes to the, to the watering hole and if I say to them, 
do you have some water? And she says, yes, and I'll, feed, I'll put water for your camels. That's the one. And lo and behold, that is exactly what happens, and it's Rebecca. And you look at the Bible text, it says that um, when the servant saw Rebecca to be the wife of Isaac, and he put gold bracelets on her, in the Bible text it says that Laban looked at all those things and said to him, oh, stay for a bit longer. Maybe he's hoping to trick him out of more gold. So J Jacob runs away and he goes to live with Uncle Laban and he doesn't know what's in store for him. Jacob falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. Jacob ha uh, Laban had two daughters, uh, Leah, who it says had weak eyes, and Rachel, who was fine in form and beautiful. Laban asked Jacob, what do you want as your wages? Jacob was so in love with Rachel, he said, I'll work for seven years just for Rachel. That's love. Uh, let me see. How much did he work for? So average salary today is about 35,000 pounds a year, right? About 35,000? Some of you say, ah, I wouldn't get out of bed for that. <laughs> 35,000 pounds a year or so. So seven years, that's about 240,000, nearly a quarter of a million pounds. Jacob worked for a quarter of a million pounds wages for his wife. I see the men say, oh, no. what about that? Give you a simple diary, a couple of cows and a lamb. <laughs> So he works for seven years for Rachel, and we know the story, right? After seven years, uh, he, gets, he goes to his wedding day, his wife must have on a veil, and he said, oh, seven years, I'm going to marry my beautiful Rachel. And he goes in with his wife, and he sleeps with his wife, and she must have kept her veil on. And in the morning, she says, surprise! surprise! And what does the Bible say? And he looked, and there it came to pass, Genesis 29, 25, it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And listen to this. Jacob says to Laban, Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why have you deceived me? Do you get the irony? Jacob, 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 why are you in this house in the first place? Why are you there in the first place? You've been a trickster your whole life, and the first time the biter gets bitten, he's crying like a baby. There is a phrase that says, there is none so blind as those who will not see. We as human beings, we can be so blind. We can be so blind to ourselves. We can, we can think that the problem is with the other person. There have been times in my, in my married life, I'll confess, Sheila and I have had a disagreement. I'm convinced she's wrong. She's wrong. She's wrong and I'm right. And then later on, God just opens my eyes and I'm like, oh my goodness gracious me. It was me all the time. We can be so blind to ourselves. We can be so blind to our true condition. We can be so blind. Jacob was so blind to his own condition. He didn't realize that the biggest trickster of the lot of them was him. He didn't realize that what he was going through was what he had put so many people through so many times, probably for most of his life. Jacob had to be exposed to someone who was badder than him in order to see the full enormity of his actions. I remember a couple of years ago, I, I was um, uh, my line manager. Um, I won't say his name because he might be watching online. If you're watching, John, I forgive you. Um, my line manager, he, he was rough. He was rough. He was unhelpful. He was unkind. He was rude. He was abrupt. He was gruff. Um, he was just rough. He was rough. He blamed me for things that had nothing to do with me. He had no sympathy, no understanding. Maybe he did on Christmas Day, but, you know, it was just, it was really rough working for him. And I remember, I think I was in just, you know, devotion time one day and just thinking about how rough he was and feeling sorry for myself, if I'm being honest. And I remember God said to me very clearly, this is what it's like dealing with you. I need to show you what you're like. That's very sobering. Yeah, so see how you feel? It's how you make others feel. See how you feel the lack of understanding, the lack of patience, the lack of tenderness, the lack of mercy? You see, all, you see how that feels to be on the receiving end? Yeah. That's what people have been on the receiving end with you many times. It's humbling. I had to shut my mouth. I had to shut my complaining and take my li licks. My, um, what do you say in Walthamstow? This is a posh area. Um, 
I had to take my, my chastisement like a grown man. Really, it was a humbling, sobering experience. God had to improvise in order to open Jacob's eyes. The Bible says the higher God's ways, as high as the heavens are from the earth, are God's ways from our ways. And one of the, one of the, the, the things we, that that tells us is that whatever God is doing, no matter how strange it looks, it really is designed for our good. What Jacob was going through with Laban, Laban and Leah and Rachel, God was actually trying to help develop his character and, and burn off the chaff of his, of his sinfulness. But God couldn't just come down and say, Jacob, you're a thief, stop it. So God had to give him exposure to a bigger thief than him. All of these things were happening to Jacob to teach him a lesson. So seven more years he works for Rachel and he finally gets his wife. He finally gets the love of his life. He's still working for Laban. Laban is still tricking him. In the Bible, Jacob says he, Laban changed his wages 10 times. That means Laban would have said to him, Jacob, I'll pay you 50 shekels a week. And at the end of the week, Laban would have said, 50 shekels? Did I say 50 shekels a week? No, I meant month. Month, Jacob, month. Read my lips, month. Okay, no problem. 50 shekels a month. Okay, comes the end of the month. Laban, my 50 shekels, that month, that month, did I say month? Did I say every month? Every other month, read my lips, every other month, 50 shekels. Okay, comes to every month, 50 shekels. Yeah, here's 50 shekels, but hold on a second. You lost a sheep, that's two shekels. You lost a cow, that's five shekels. Here, take your five shekels. What happened to 50? Uh, taxes. He would have, Bible says he changed his wages 10 times. Finally, Jacob has had enough. He now has two wives. He has 11 children. He has two concubines. He decides to leave. He's had enough. He's, time, he's a grown man now. He has his family. It's time to leave Laban's house and launch out on his own. So he leaves and he's on his way. His wife, two wives, concubines, 11 children, all his flocks and herds, which he's amassed a lot. And then he gets a message, unfinished business, unfinished business. He gets a message, your brother Esau is coming to meet you with 400 armed men. Unfinished business, unfinished business. You know, um, we have a phrase, sorry to keep giving you Barbadian phrases, but we have a phrase in Barbados. It says, moon run till they catch you. Moon run till they catch you. And it basically means, <sighs> how do you explain that phrase in English? So it basically means the moon, the moon is king at night, right? But the day is going to come. And once the day comes, the moon is yesterday's news. You can, you can, you can prance and dance and whatever until, until your time comes. When your time comes, you have to sit down and be quiet unfinished business. Jacob was running like the moon, but then his brother Esau, who he had unfinished business with, is coming for him, and not by himself. Remember, Je remember Esau is the soft boy. Esau is the mummy's boy. Esau is the mama, sorry, Jacob is the mama man. Esau is the fighter, he's the hunter, and now it's been, what, 20, 20 or so years, 25 years maybe, since they've parted? Esau has a band of 400 men, and he's coming for Jacob. I remember Unfinished business, unfinished business. Something in your conscience that you haven't dealt with, that's bugging you. You're smiling, you have a nice smile. Maybe you've risen to a high position, but unfinished business. Maybe, I think, I think each of these characters we're gonna look at this week draws me because maybe I see a bit of myself in them. I look at Jacob and I, I, I kind of dislike him, really. There's a few Bible characters I dislike. Um, I kind of dislike Jacob. I just think, you're such a crook. You're a sneaky little crook. You're that boy in the class who's a little quiet, and if anybody touches you, cry to the teacher, and when the teacher's gone, you're kicking people, kicking them, and then when the teacher comes, miss. Are you... But then I look at Jacob, and I see a lot of myself in Jacob. I remember when I was younger, um, you know, growing up, a lot of Caribbean kids growing up in the UK in the 70s, 
uh, weren't rich at all. Weren't rich. We, we were kind of poor. You could tell who was rich at camp meeting because when you went to camp meeting, there was only one or two new cars there. One or two new cars, really. Um, so you could tell who was rich. You could tell who had money and you could tell who didn't. Uh, the poor kids would have bust out shoes. I remember going to school one time and I remember going to school one time and um, my shoes had holes in them, but it was raining. So I took the bag from the bread, the empty bread bag, the plastic bag, and I put my feet in it to try and keep my feet dry going to school because the shoes had holes. There was five kids. My parents were working class, had working class jobs. There's no money to buy me no shoes. So you do what you have to do, right? I remember my brother going to the shop when my mum gave him 10 pounds to buy a pair of shoes. And he came back with one P change because he bought a pair of brown leather moccasins for £9.99. My mum hit the roof. Hit the roof. That could have bought two shoes, a suit, and, and, and groceries for the week. We didn't have much money at all. And I remember I, I to go to school and I would see the other kids there and they had more and they could buy sweets. And I just wanted what they had. So I think, I can't remember the first time, I'm trying to remember the first time, I don't think it was money actually, I think it was ice lollies. The first thing I ever stole was ice lollies. I wanted some ice lollies, I think my mum must have said you can have one. And I had one and the ice lolly was nice, like Suzanne's cake, it was nice. And just like the cake, I wanted another piece but I couldn't have no more. Couldn't have no more ice lollies. So everybody's in the, fr the, 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 the one room, the dining room, the, the room we eat in, the room we watch TV and everybody's in the one room. And I sneak to the kitchen, and nobody's there. So I go in and I sneak her, I slowly put it in my trousers, go upstairs. It's nice. I got away with it. So next time is another ice lolly, and then two ice lollies, and then three ice lollies. And this is good. I can get my fill of ice lollies with nobody knowing. And I think it must have been, I don't know, maybe some money was left out. And slipped some in my pocket. Go to school, go to the shop, get some sweets, go to school, sweets are nice, it's good. I can give out to my friends, I give my friends some sweets, my friends like me, this is good. And then the habit is just building and building, building and building. Maybe that's why I'm drawn to Jacob. And then I went to my piano teacher, I was having piano lessons, went to the piano teacher's house, and he went to the toilet, and, and he left his wallet there. And um, had a look in, it was 10 pounds. So I took it. And I went to Wimpy. I don't think you have Wimpy anymore. I went to Wimpy, I bought myself, I think I bought myself a double, ham, a double quarter pounder, and I had a wonderful meal. I wasn't really, I wasn't stealing to, I just, I just wanted stuff, and we were poor. It's no excuse, but that's really what was going on. And um, my piano teacher found out, and he said, I'm not teaching him piano lessons anymore. And, and it was such an embarrassment because people say, why did you stop piano lessons? I said, oh, I got fed up. Ah. <laughs> no, the, the, truth, the truth was my piano teacher kicked me out. And um, years later, I'm in my 40s now. I'm in my 40s now. And this thing has burned me all my life because I never confessed to him. I never confessed to my parents. Never. Never confessed. Never confessed. I said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I look at the kids now and I didn't do it. I think, you're such a liar. But at the time, I thought I was believable. I really thought I was believable. Um, and I think God put it on my heart to find this man. And I looked him up. I looked him up and I found him. And I found his number. And I called him and I confessed. And I was in my 40s and this happened when I was 13. And I felt so blessed. I felt such a relief, a release. Unfinished business, guilt. I remember watching a program, it was uh, T.D. Jakes ran a, did a TV show a couple of years ago and on the show was a guy who was falsely accused of, I think it was a murder and the guys who conspired against him, he went to prison and when you looked on the show, he was sat there comfortable, smiling, confident and the guys who actually lied on him, one of them was, had terrible health terrible health. He had such high blood pressure. All the medication in the world couldn't get his blood pressure down. And he, he, he said he basically couldn't live with himself. So the person who put him in prison was having a terrible time. He himself was in prison. And that's what it's like when you have guilt, when you have unfinished business. It's like you may be free, but you're not. Jacob was not free because he knew he had unfinished business with Esau. And when he got that message, Esau is coming to meet you with 400 men he knew he's not tricking his way out of this one. There's no mum here to get him out of it. He has to face his 
brother. So Jacob resorts to what Jacob does best. He resorts to strategy. He resorts to tricking. So he says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Leah. No, I'm going to send the animals first. I'm going to send some food first because Esau likes to eat food. Then I'm going to send Leah with her kids and the others with their kids. Then Rachel and Joseph and then me. Maybe all of that will soften him up. That's his plan. Tomorrow he's going to meet his brother Esau. And he lies down and he goes to sleep. But before he goes to sleep, he prays this prayer. He prays a prayer that arrests the heart of God. Listen to his prayer. O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Amen. What was it about this prayer that arrested the heart of God? I want to suggest three things about this prayer. Number one, Jacob was honest. Maybe for the first time in his life, he was truly honest. Lord, I'm afraid. It's a big thing for a grown man to say, I'm afraid. A lot of times as grown men, we will cover fear with anger. Children, here's a secret. A lot of time when your dad is angry with you, he's afraid. You come in late, two o'clock in the morning, your dad's angry, 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 he's afraid. But we don't know how to show fear because fear makes us vulnerable. So we, we, we subconsciously turn it into anger. Jacob was willing to humble himself and admit, I am afraid. I'm scared. Lord, I'm scared. Secondly, he was humble. Listen to what he said. I am unworthy. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. He describes himself as God's servant. And he says he's unworthy of the blessings that God has given him. Third, he acknowledged the sovereignty of God. Instead of relying on himself, now remember Jacob always relied on himself, always turned to his trickery, always turned to his shystin. Now, in his prayer, he says, Sovereign God, God of my father, Abraham and Isaac. He's turning to God and not his trickery. And lastly, four, he sought God's glory instead of his own. But you, Jacob says, you, Father, Lord, have said that I will make you prosper and make your descendants like the sand of the sea. He is now seeking the glory of God instead of the glory of himself. Many times we seek to become great by being great. We seek to become great by being great, by doing great things, by being great people. But Jesus said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of of all. Question for you, who are the richest people in the world? Who are the richest people in the world? The person who supplies you sellotape and staples and, and, and a rack for your sandals to, for you to put them on when you come home from work. That's who the richest man in the world is. His name is Jeff Bezos. He supplies you with, 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 with vitamins and any little beanie beanie thing you want, you go on Amazon and you buy it and it comes to your door. He is a servant. And because he's a servant, we use him over and over and over and over and over and over again. And he is worth, I don't know, how many billion? How many billion? What about the other guy? Mr. Musk. He supplies people cars. 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 He supplies people cars. The richest people in the world are, serv are servants. People who, 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 who have oil fields, they provide us with oil and petrol. That's what they do. No, nothing particularly fancy. They provide us with a need. When people, Jesus said, in order to be great, be a great servant. Jacob had been serving himself his whole life, but now, finally, he sought to be a servant and serve God. 
And it's like God is saying to Jacob, if you take care of my business, I will take care of your business. So God heard his prayer and he decided to come himself and meet Jacob. Many times God will speak to us in dreams. Many times God will send his angel. But this time with Jacob, he came himself. It says in the Bible that that night, God, Jacob, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants. He sent them ahead. I'm jumping, jumping down now to verse 24. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that his, he could not overpower, overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Good question. Big question. He's asking him, who are you? He's asking him more than what's your name. He's asking, who are you? Jacob sheepishly has to reply, thief, con man, trickster, that's who I am. Then the man said to him, you will no longer be Jacob, thief, trickster, con man, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and humans and have overcome. God changed his name. God is in the name changing, character changing business. You, we were, I was talking with um, Selena at lunchtime. We were talking about what pretty much people my age always talk about. We talk about our kids and we talk about them and this and that and this and that and this and that and all the things we want for them and all the things we long for with them. But, you know, you talk to them, you're blue in the face. They, 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 they're themselves. They're themselves. Only God can change. I, I thought my mom was quite a good Christian parent, but she didn't really change me. It was God who changed me, really. I mean, she led me to the water, but it was God. God was the one who drew me in to drink. And we see it with our children. I, 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 you know, some of them are aware that I'd like them to be in the, in the faith, and others are not. And it has to be God's time. No matter what I say, I don't have, I don't have the skills of God to draw them. It was God who drew Jacob to himself. God, Jacob struggled with God. He struggled with men. The truth was Jacob had been struggling with God and men his whole life. All of his trickstin, all of his shystin, he was struggling. He was wrestling men. He was not at peace with men. He was running his whole life, running away, doing stuff, getting caught, running away. Doing stuff, getting caught, running away. God met with Jacob that night. God fought with him, yes. But he met him. In truth, God had been fighting, as I said, with Jacob his whole life. God had been fighting with Jacob to get him to trust him, to get him to be honest, to get him to value people the same way that he valued himself, to give his hopes and his dreams and his goals to God and let God meet them. You know, the devil can't invent any new desires. Did you know that? The devil does not invent any desires. The temptation that the devil uses is for us to meet our godly desires, but quicker and in a different way than God said so. You think about all sin, all temptation. The devil can't invent, I mean, you tempt people with chocolate, you tempt them with cake, you can't tempt people with celery, you can't tempt people with tomatoes, you know, you can't tempt them with being cold. You tempt people with nice things, things we already desire. That's what the devil tempts us with. But he says if you do it, God's way is too long. God's way is too hard. God's way is too arduous. Do it my way. You want affection? You want love? Don't go through all that courtship business. Just go on to babes.com. You can have all the love you want. You want to feel good about yourself? Don't work hard. Don't trust in God. That takes long. Just go and buy yourself some whatever it is, pick a brand, Prada, Balenciaga, whatever, then you can feel good about yourself. All of the things devil, the devil offers are really things that God offers but quicker and cheaper and in a dishonest way. God was trying to get Jacob to give his hopes and dreams to him instead of trying to meet them himself. Ephesians, 4, Ephesians 1 verse 13 and 14 says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. When you believe, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our, our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession 
to his praise and glory. What does that mean? What it means is, is that when we believed, when we came to Christ, he gave us his Holy Spirit to begin working in our character to make us like Jesus. And he's working and working and working and working on us for our whole lives. And that is what was happening with Jacob. So God met him. God gave him a new name. And Saul now begins a new story in the life of Jacob. His, no, his name is no longer Jacob, but Israel, which means may God prevail. However, in this meeting, God also gave him a limp. And that limp was with him for the rest of his life. So he's saved, but limping. He's now close to God, but he has a hitch in his step. Yeah? He's now healed, but he's handicapped. And sometimes God will do that. I believe, the Bible tells us in this story, that when, God go, when Jacob finally meets Esau, Esau runs to him and he forgives him and they hug each other. I believe that when Esau saw Jacob limping, it softened his heart. So the very thing which to him was an impediment was a, 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 a hindrance could have been the thing that saved his life. Because remember, Esau's coming to him with 400 armed men. He's not coming to play tic-tac-toe. He's not coming to play rock, paper, scissors. He's not coming to, to have a little meeting and say, how's life and whatever? How's mom? You see mom? No, I see that. No, he's not coming with four armed men, 100 armed men for none of that. I believe Esau was coming to wipe him and his clan out. I also believe, just my, my, my spiritual imagination, I believe that God also met Esau that night too. Because what Esau was coming to do Something miraculous happened between him leaving with his men and meeting Jacob, his brother. Has God given you a limp? Is it your health? Is that a limp? Your church? Your marriage? Your children? Your job? Where you live? People around you? Ever seen them programs, Neighbors from Hell? Huh? Or maybe your finances, you can't just, you can't keep the money together. You and just when you're getting on your feet, they've gone and put up the gas bill. My gas bill went up, it's 150 pounds in one month. It's gone up, petrol, wow, through the roof. Or maybe, maybe it's aspects of our personality that are a limp. Maybe, maybe, maybe we've got an issue. Maybe we've got, maybe we're suffering from a mental issue. All these things in our lives, things that we might consider to be things that make us broken, could it be that God allows them as our limp to save our soul? Could it be things that we've tried to fix over and over and over again? And God says, no, I'm not fixing it. Listen to what God said to Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, I had a thorn in the flesh. And remember, this is the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. He's God's guy, right? He's God's guy. His name was Saul. He becomes Paul. He's God's guy. He takes the message to the Ephesians. He takes it to the Corinthians. He takes it to the Romans. He takes it to the Galatians. He sends a message to Timothy. He sends it to the Thessalonians. He is God's guy, right? He, is, he has helped people raise from the dead. He has healed sick people. He is God's man. Now, he has a problem, right? He's gone all over the world taking the message to people. Now, he has a problem. And he prays to the Lord, Lord, take it from me. And what does God say? No. 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 I won't. I can, but I won't. A lot of time, they don't teach you that in baptismal class. They don't teach you a lot of time. It's not to criticize them. It's just maybe it will be too much to handle. A lot of times early in our Christianity, they don't teach us that God will not always answer your prayer in the way that you want. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. It is my design that you're weak. I have designed it so that you're weak. What did God say to Gideon when he won the battle with 300 men? I want you to have too few men. So that when you win, you, have, you are under no illusion that it was you. 
I want you to be under no illusion that's you. So get rid of them. Too much. Get, get rid of them. Jacob, I'm giving you a limp. And Jacob had that limp for the rest of his life. It never went. He was God's guy. But he was God's guy with a limp. There are many things that we can debate as to whether they're essential for salvation. Some people will say you need to keep the Sabbath. If you don't keep the Sabbath, you're not going to be saved. Some people will say you need to keep the, keep the other Ten Commandments, you won't be saved. There's one thing that there's no debate about whether or not you can have it and be saved, and that's pride. There's no debate. God hates pride. Uh, God said that the sin of pride is like the sin of divination. Right? That means that to God, a prideful person is as bad as a witch. Right? He's as bad as a witch, okay? That's, that's uh, my friend Andrew Fuller would say, facts. That's facts. I can't say it like Andrew. But he says, God says, pride is like divination. So the thing that God really wants to root out of our, he wants to root so many things out, he wants to root out pride. And sometimes he uses the pride, the limp, to root out the pride. Let's have a look at the role of faith. I mentioned that this morning. Different people who were in the Hebrews 11 role of faith. Look at the limps that they had. Abraham and Sarah, childless, way into their old age. Moses had a stammer. Had a stammer. As I mentioned this morning, Rahab was a prostitute. All of them had limps. But all of them were faithful unto the end, and we will see them in the kingdom. So the message of today really is simply this. You may have a limp in your life. You may have an impediment. You may have something that you just can't lick. But the promises of God are true. In all things, God works for the good of them that love him and fear him. He will use everything in your life to bless you and to take you and make you what he wants you to be. Look at what happened in Jacob's life. Look at what happened in Jacob's life. He had his 12 children. In fact, he had 13. He may have had other children, but they didn't mention the girls in those days. But we know of 13 children that he had. His son, Joseph, became the leader of the whole of Egypt. He saved the whole nation of Egypt and all the surrounding peoples. Jacob is the father of the children of Israel. His descendants really did become as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They, through his son Judah, Jesus was born. Okay? Jacob, we know that when God describes himself, he describes himself as the father. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is one of the three people that God names himself as God of. And I like the Jacob one. Because Abraham, yeah, he was a patriarch. He made a couple of mistakes, but he was a good guy. Isaac, he was pretty good. But the God of Jacob, that makes... The, I wouldn't know how merciful God was unless he was the God of Jacob. I wouldn't know that God can take me to where he wants me to go, even if I'm damaged goods, unless he was the God of Jacob. There's, some, there's a reason why he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Many of us in this room are Jacobs. We have that limp. We have that impediment. We have things that haven't gone well for us. We have things in our lives that just haven't worked out the way we would want them to work out. We have things in our character that are not finished yet. We're not the finished article. But the Jacob story tells us that if we will take ourselves, our flawed, frail, feeble self, and if we will give it to God, great things will happen. What does the Bible say? Beloved, I would above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Limp and all. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Messiah. And um, I'm, I'm just thinking that God has given us this, this limp um, to, to save us. And some of us are going to be saved because of the limp. Um, and you remember this, the, the situation with Paul? Was, well, he had a, a sharp, penetrating, throbbing pain called a thorn in the flesh. And a thorn by itself is impediment. But, 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 but this is a thorn 
plus the grace of God is victory. Amen. And um, Jacob had his limp, and that's an imped impediment, you know, but with the grace of God, uh, let me tell you, um, he's, a, he's a victor. We too can be uh, victorious. I hope you are appreciating these messages. They're sent um, for us, for our learning, for our for, for the deepening of our faith. I think um, we still, uh, all of us need a kind of recalibration, you know, after this COVID thing and even before that. And um, God is finding a way um, somehow um, to draw us back to him and, and to walk the, the, the straight, straight and narrow path that he has set before us. Thanks to, thank you so much, um, Elder Messiah, for, for accepting the call to share these messages uh, with the Wolf and the Stowe Church. Uh, for those who are watching online, Thank you for tuning in. I'm going to ask you to um, just um, close us off in prayer. Let's sing the, the song, um, Revive Us Again, and um, then I'm going to ask um, our elder to close us in prayer. Ask you all to stand as we sing Revive Us Again. so much for speaking to us today. Lord, everything you do for us has a, has a reason. Everything you allow us to go through is for a reason. Lord, help us not to lose heart. Help us not to lose faith, but help us to keep trusting. Help us to keep believing in your word, Lord. Help us to hold on to it and cling to it and depend on it, Lord. Lord, it's going to come true. For sure it's going to come true. Help us to hold on and keep going and keep trusting you, Lord. Be with us as we leave here and go our separate ways, our several ways. Um, take care of us, Lord. Help us that as we leave and all the different things that we do, Lord, that we will commit them to you, we will commit ourselves to you as we go through them. If it's your will, bring us back together again tomorrow night so that we can be fed by you once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good evening, everyone. See you at 6.30 p.m. tomorrow evening. Bring a friend or bring somebody with you. <laughs>